You're watching Tag. Hello, viewers. Welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Indian security forces eliminate Pakistan-backed terrorists in Kashmir. U.S. troops' departure might destabilize Afghanistan, believes expert. And Pakistan continues to support dreaded terror outfits. Pakistan has run amok ever since Indian administration abrogated Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir, enabling the Indian state to receive direct benefits from the center. It has intensified its efforts at increasing the strength of terrorists along the line of control. Pakistan-backed terrorists are trying hard to create unrest through constant attacks and ceasefire violations in Kashmir. However, all of their attempts have been foiled by Indian security forces. Recently, Indian security forces successfully busted terror modules and gunned down four terrorists during an encounter, a report. Kashmir, often called the heaven on earth, has been continuously witnessing violence and chaos owing to the malicious agendas of Pakistan-backed terrorists present in the valley. Scrapping of special status of Jammu and Kashmir has badly rattled Pakistan, which is desperately carrying out ceasefire violations to infiltrate terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir in order to create civil unrest in the valley. Civilians in the region are forced to live in an atmosphere of constant fear and terror as these terrorists forcefully capture their houses to carry out terror activities by threatening and even attacking them. However, vigilant Indian forces have thwarted almost all of their ill designs in past few weeks. A significant number of terrorists have been eliminated while many others have been apprehended. Recently, after a tip-off about three militants hiding in Shopian district of Kashmir, a search and cordon operation was launched, leading to a gun battle as terrorists opened fire towards security forces. Subsequently, security forces killed three terrorists belonging to Hizbul Mujahideen terror group, including its top commander, Wasim. The three men were responsible for the deaths of a dozen people, including four police officers in the region. खबर आ रही थी कि वाची और उसके आसपास के गांव में उग्रवादियों की काफी हरकत है और जो सिविल पॉपुलेशन है वहां वो उससे काफी परेशान है क्योंकि वह उनसे खाना और रहने की जगह जोर जबरदस्त जोर जबरदस्ती करके मांग रहे हैं इस पर नजर रखे हुए हमारे कुछ जवानों ने आज सवेरे यह हरकत देखी और इन उग्रवादियों को एंगेज करते हुए पूरे टैक्टिक्स के साथ बगैर किसी सिविलियन प्रॉपर्टी या जान का नुकसान करते हुए इनका खात्मा किया द प्रेजेंस ऑफ पाकिस्तान बैक टेररिस्ट इन द वैली हैज बीन अ मेजर कॉज ऑफ कंसर्न फॉर इंडिया दे हैव कंटिन्यू दियर टैक्स डिस्पाइट रिसीविंग मेजर सेटबैक्स बाय इंडियन आर्मी इन अ सेपरेट इंसिडेंट Terrorist hurled a petrol bomb at security forces in Jammu and Kashmir's Purwama district. However, the attack didn't cause any damage. Following the attack on CRPF personnel, security forces immediately cordoned off the area and eliminated one terrorist, who was found to have his allegiance with Pakistan-backed Jaish e Mohammed. Two Indian security personnel also lost their lives during the encounter. These terror attacks are meant not only to cause large-scale damage to life and property, but also to create an atmosphere of fear and terror among the people of Jammu and Kashmir. The Pakistan is not feeling comfortable with what is developing in Jammu and Kashmir. It is by various messages which have been actually recorded. Pakistan is guiding the terrorists that they must create problem with the civilians which it has been doing continuously Pakistan has always used terrorism as proxy to wage war against India and it has intensified its operations ever since New Delhi revoked the special status of Jammu and Kashmir 
bifurcating it into two union territories. According to Indian government, in 2019, over 3,200 incidents of ceasefire violations from across LOC have been reported. Of these, 1,565 ceasefire violations took place since August 2019 after the abrogation of Article 370. With such vicious attempts, Pakistan is trying to create the state of turmoil in Kashmir by threatening civilians. These civilians are killed to create a fear and a feeling of distrust against Indians and also to create such a situation where the people become totally unhappy though the situation is becoming better and better and with the development which is likely to come very soon and is also coming now with the minister going there it is not possible for the uh, Pakistanis to uh, accept this situation because their army as such is being uh, developed on a situation where they say that India is an enemy, we got to keep on fighting with them and if we are having something to fight, then only we will survive, other Pakistani will throw them out. No, it is for their safety and for their power, they want to create problems in India. While the situation in Jammu and Kashmir is returning back to normalcy, Pakistan has intensified its efforts at increasing the strength of terrorists in launch pads along the line of control to create havoc in the region. Such consistent attempts by Pakistan at fomenting trouble and breaching harmony in an otherwise peaceful Kashmir reek off its duplicity. Moving on, the fledgling democracy in Afghanistan is under US protection for nearly 18 years. Where the U.S. troops actively guarded the Afghan men and territory for more than a decade after the ouster of Taliban regime, they have been training and assisting Afghan forces for past five years. However, it appears that Washington, which promised to significantly reduce its troops in Afghanistan following a peace deal with Taliban, might have to walk the talk as the process is gaining momentum. Today, in this edition of Newsweek South Asia, we focus on how U.S. departure from the region can have drastic consequences, not just on this war-torn country, but the entire South Asia, a report. The number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, which has reduced from over 100,000 in 2011 to around 14,000 today, might come down to absolute zero in coming months. President Trump, who pitched for the withdrawal of U.S. soldiers from Afghanistan during his presidential campaign in 2016, has on several occasions indicated that Washington is mulling over calling its soldiers back from the protracted war. He is further being pushed by his political rivals to fulfill his promises. The on and off peace process between the Taliban and the United States is also sustaining over Washington's promise of withdrawing its forces from the region. However, both Kabul and Washington are unsure and uncomfortable over the question whether peace will definitely return to war on country once the U.S. Army departs. And if not, then what? You know, Taliban, uh, basically, they are zealots. They don't believe in peace or development. Uh, they have their different agenda. Their agenda is to implement uh, extremist religious ideology in the country and we have seen in the past what they have done to in Afghanistan so they'll repeat the same thing you know. and uh, that is why large majority of the people in uh, in Afghanistan are opposing almost 70 more than 70 80 percent people are opposed to these peace talks or uh, they don't want at least the Taliban to come to the power Terrorist group Al-Qaeda, which America believed was decimated by its forces in 2001, has dispensed more than one proof of its existence and resurgence. While it was hiding and recovering earlier from the U.S. onslaught in federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, it is now believed to have several functional camps inside Afghanistan. 
There is an apprehension that U.S. departure followed with the possible covert support from Taliban. The Al-Qaeda will grow dreadful and fearless. Pakistan, a state that has historically supported the rise of terrorism and have been the epicenter of several terrorist attacks across South Asia, will capitalize the situation. And this will pose a greater security challenge to entire Indian subcontinent and Middle East. It's a matter of great concern not only for South Asia but all equally important, equally a concern would be you know in uh, Central Asia and Caucasus region because this is the region where similar Islamic ideology you know uh, is prevailing and uh, these are the places you know uh, they have already uh, Pakistan has already helped establish militant groups in these countries so, uh, so so I don't think you know they will continue to uh, promote their agenda they are not going to sit ideally you know, even if they think it is their religious duty uh, to to spread uh, their version of Islam Peace is still an elusive dream in Afghanistan where the Taliban have been rapidly gaining ground and control large swathes of territory today. A clear winner of the September presidential election has still not been declared. The situation will more likely deteriorate if Taliban, the insurgent group which has rejected the idea of a democratic peaceful atmosphere, becomes a major player in government formation. The Islamic fanaticism might provide a conducive atmosphere to the rise of more radical organizations, thereby posing another challenge, not just to Afghans, but entire South Asia. Political experts say that the talks won't solve the problems until Afghan government is a stakeholder in it. I don't think uh, something very substantial will come out of it. Uh. Uh, because uh, the main stakeholders, the government and uh, the other civil society group are still out of the peace negotiations, uh, mainly the government, you know, which is the most important part, you know, which uh, is responsible for uh, maintaining peace and stability in the country, you know, is uh, not a stakeholder as yet. The United States has lost more than 2,400 troops since 2001. The start and stop peace talks have failed in delivering anything substantial. While sometimes it is the insurgent Taliban who declined the government offers, on other occasions, the Kabul establishment refuses to approve Taliban proposals. Critics say that in such an endless and uncertain situation, U.S. troop withdrawal should be the priority of the U.S. government. Withdrawal uh, will not help solve the problem, you know, because this is unfinished agenda. Uh, before withdrawal, I think they should develop some mechanism, you know, uh, whereby uh, the the training for these uh, armed forces uh, of Talib of Afghanistan continues. Some funding should uh, continue to flow in Afghanistan so that uh, institutions. Uh, 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 other institution of the state should also be strengthened and uh, uh, I think it is a responsibility of the international community to see to it you know okay, that Afghanistan do not destabilize and uh, you know it will have direct repercussions particularly on neighboring countries as well as in India you know. It is not just Taliban and Al-Qaeda but terrorist groups, including the Islamic State, have been rearing their head and are waiting for an opportune time to strike. The security vacuum might be taken over by them. While the U.S. troops' absence is going to be detrimental, it is also a matter of fact that a large section of the Afghan population wants them to leave. They believe that Washington is driven by power and has its personal motivations behind their prolonged stay. Political class led by President Ashraf Ghani, however, have rejected the Senatism and have time and again expressed its gratitude for the U.S. government.
As Pakistan continues to accelerate both diplomatic and administrative efforts in a bid to exit the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force, the global illicit financing watchdog, the direct terror outfits continue to operate from its soil. This has posed a security threat to the entire South Asia and the rest of the world. Experts believe that world is facing difficulties to fight against state-sponsored terrorism and growing threats of Islamic radicalism. We have a report. Pakistan was placed on the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF's grey list, in June 2018 for 15 months. In October 2019, the FATF announced that it would retain Pakistan on its grey list for four months, asking Pakistan to address all issues identified in the action plan by February 2020. Failure to do so could lead to sanctions on the country's banking system. Recently, a Pakistani delegation headed by Minister for Economic Affairs Hamad Azhar visited Beijing to attend FATF's meet to defend country's compliance on 22 action points given by FATF to assess Pakistan's progress related to combating money laundering and terror financing. According to media reports, Pakistan provided details of the cases registered against the banned outfits, sentences given to members of proscribed organizations, steps taken against money laundering, investigation into over 500 cases of transfer of funds to terror groups and elimination of terror finance system. But experts believe that Pakistani territory continues to remain hub of the Taliban, Haqqani network, lashkar e taiba and other terror outfits. The Taliban are still based in Pakistan. That's why they call the Kuwaita Shura. Uh, the Haqqani network is still in Pakistan. Uh, the training camps and the madrasas uh, are still in Pakistan. Uh, much of the funding comes from Pakistan. Um, so uh, Pakistan's involvement uh, is an ongoing thing. It's not, it hasn't stopped. And without, without the Pakistani uh, support, the Taliban would not be the force it is today. To fulfill FATF's recommendations, Pakistan is building de-radicalization camps for thousands of young men in the country lured by terrorists. According to assessments by intelligence agencies, each center has a capacity of 700 and dozens of such centers are present in Punjab, Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Satellite images show that many of these camps are expanding with new centers being constructed to accommodate more and more people. Intelligence assessment shows that 92% of those in these camps are below the age of 35 and 12% are not even adults. Experts have shown concern over growing radicalism among Islamic countries, but the major global figure emerges from the state-sponsored terrorism. Radical violent Islam is not going away anytime soon, but uh, state sponsorship of terrorism is the one that's the most difficult to counter. You can counter the lone wolf in Belgium or you can use you know Facebook and relationship with Facebook to limit the amplification of their messages but what if tens of thousands of kids are recruited trained indoctrinated in this sort of thinking and ideology given weapons and told to do certain things how do you defeat that and unless you deal with the state that sponsors these terrorist organizations this battle will be lost the war will be lost sorry Experts also believe that sanctions on Pakistan by international community will do some magic. Sanctions will play an important role and I think Pakistan is a, is a big country of 200 million plus uh, people. Uh, I, I think a little bit of pressure and, and uh, I think that the, the Pakistani nationals and a lot of them are not radicals will stand up and say to their government, to their military, enough is enough. Why should we be punished because of your flawed foreign policy, uh, which uh, entails supporting terrorist organizations, whether it's in India or Afghanistan. Terrorism emanating from the soil of the Pakistan 
is not affecting the neighboring countries like India and Afghanistan, but it is filled the lives of the people in Pakistan with fear, anxiety and hate. With several operations conducted by the Pakistani army in the recent years, terrorism was claimed to have been curbed. But the country continues to face terror attacks, recent being a blast in a mosque in Balochistan, which killed several civilians. Pakistan is making great efforts to get off the FATF grey list. After the latest meeting of the Asia-Pacific Joint Group, the FATF International Cooperation Review Group that concluded in Beijing on 23rd January, there are certainly high chances of Pakistan exiting the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force at its plenary to be held on February 16th this year. But there are evidences available which make it very clear that Pakistan has taken no real action against any of the terror networks and terrorists, especially lashkar e toiba jaish muhammad and the likes of Masood Azhar. Well, to speak more on this, we are now joined by an expert. So, despite several warnings from India and FATF, Pakistan continues to fund terror activities in South Asia. How do you see this, sir? See, Pakistan will keep on doing this. It has been the policy of Pakistan since the time of its independence. And uh, if you look into the uh, strategy of Pakistan or if you look into its policies from 1950s onwards, Pakistan has been indulging in this and Pakistan will keep on doing this. The basic modus operandi of Pakistan is uh, uh, to export terror across the globe and more so against India because uh, Pakistan has been hostile towards India right from 1947 onwards since its creation and uh, it always racks up the issue of Jammu and Kashmir and it will keep on doing that you know because uh, the stakeholders in Pakistan they sustain uh, and they survive on this whole uh, modus operandi and in this whole mechanism of terror funding as such. Pakistan has failed miserably in prosecuting terror leaders in terror funding cases. Do you think FATF will take this into consideration while taking up Pakistan's case in February 2020 in Beijing? Yes, it should take into consideration all this and uh, the kind of uh, lackluster measure which Pakistan has taken against all important uh, terror outfits and against all uh, global dreaded terrorists. Pakistan has now, hasn't taken any cognizable measure against any uh, global terrorist or against any global terror outfits as such. And Pakistan will not take any measures even in future. So I think uh, in the February meeting when a final decision is taken in relation to blacklisting Pakistan or not, FAT, uh, you know, FATF should take into cognizance all this and then I think uh, FATF should take a stringent action against Pakistan. Thanks for joining us. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Number one multicultural channel. This is Tag TV.